Good. All set? Yes, sir. Cool. Hello, friends. Hello. It is really nice to see you all. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Steve. If you want to find me on Twitter, I'm at ppopowitz, P-E-P-O-P-O-W-I-T-Z. -P -P the name is more exciting than the story behind it. Um, email, get in touch with me. That email address is up there. And then any of the slides that we're going to go through today are available on the internet at that URL, stephenhicks.me slash do scary things hyphen separated. I'm going to give you a little bit of a content warning before we start. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about death and dying, and we're going to show some unsettling images, uh, some common fears that you might have, things like snakes, spiders, vicious dogs, those kinds of things. If those are uncomfortable for you, just know that they're coming. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, first of all, I went to school here in Stevens Point. This is my first time back here in a classroom setting since uh, the late 90s when I was over at UW Stevens Point. And I graduated with a degree in uh, computer information systems and math, and I worked in the math room, and I was president of the math club, and I was a big time nerd, and things haven't changed much. <laughs> but now I am working at a company named Artsy. Artsy is based in New York. I don't live in New York, I live in Milwaukee. I work remotely out of my basement for Artsy. At Artsy, our mission is to expand the art market so that people can be moved by art every day. And we're doing this with a platform for collecting and discovering art. As mentioned, I love JavaScript. Does anyone love JavaScript? Somebody in this room has to besides me. Yes, thank you. There's like five of us. You can get a support group going over at Goose afterwards. <laughs> I have loved JavaScript for years. I hated JavaScript for years before that. But I started working with it in 1999 when I started my career. And I will say JavaScript in 1999 was a very scary thing. Uh, I'm a trail runner. I'm a runner in general. Um, did anyone see the news overnight about running? Does anybody have any idea what I'm talking about? Uh, Elliot Kipchoge has been chasing the dream of running a marathon in less than two hours. And he did it by about uh, 20 seconds, which is just amazing. I just completed a half marathon on trails in south, uh, southeastern Wisconsin at the Southern Kettles, and I did it in 40 seconds less than two hours. Half the distance, but there you go. Um, but what I love about trail running is it's kind of meditative for me. I love the feeling of, of knowing where every step I'm putting my foot. Every single footstep matters. I have to be fully in it the entire time, and my mind goes amazing places while I'm focused on not tripping over rocks and roots. I'm one of the many organizers of the Cream City Code Conference in Milwaukee. Um, did anyone go? It was last weekend. Anyone make the trip down? I didn't think so. That's OK. Uh, I'm a writer at these URLs. The first one is my personal blog. Um, and then the other one is the RT Engineering blog, which I'm pretty excited to write, get to write on. I'm also a speaker. I've spoken at conferences throughout the Midwest given over 40 talks, spoken in Canada. And I'm a teacher now. This is a new thing for me. I started teaching workshops. I'm teaching workshops right now on React and on test-driven development. Not together, but you could do that. Um, if you are interested in making a trip down to Milwaukee, I am teaching a full day React workshop at the end of October. Uh, you can come talk to me afterwards and I can give you information on that. But three years ago, the only one of those identities that I could have given myself without lying would be that of an engineer. All these things have come about in the last few years because I realized that I wasn't growing at all. I wasn't letting myself become uncomfortable. And overcoming some fears is what allowed me to do these things that I always wanted to do, but I was never able to start. And so I'm hopeful that today I could do three things for you. I want to help break down fear so that you understand what happens in your body when you feel it. I want to make the things that are holding you back in your career a little less scary for you. And then I want to arm you with some strategies for overcoming fear. So what is it that we fear? Does anyone want to share anything that they are afraid of? Failure. Failure. That's a great one. We're going to talk a lot about that one. Anything else? Fear itself. Fear itself. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's really quotable. Yeah. Yeah. I, no, I made that. I coined that term. You coined that term? 
<laughs> you are due a lot of money. Cool. Well, uh, the good news is you don't have to share anything with me because um, somebody did a survey, and so I know everything about everyone and their fears. Uh, Chapman University in California does a yearly survey of American fears, and they recently released their 2018 results. There's a lot of fears that they show in their results that I think we can sympathize with. Does anyone want to guess what the number one fear in 2018 was? The unknown. The unknown. Public speaking. Public speaking. We're going to talk about that. That's actually not the case. Spiders. Spiders is also not that high up. You'd be surprised. How about anything else? Poverty. Sorry, what was that? Death. Death is pretty high up there. Falling. Falling. Poverty, I heard. Uh, I think you're going to be really happy with the number one answer. <laughs> Not even kidding, this is the number one fear in Americans in 2018. So here's my interpretation of this answer. 74% of Americans are afraid of corrupt government officials, yet every single one of us knows that we have corrupt government officials, regardless of where you stand on it. So 25% of people just don't care that we have corrupt government officials. Or just don't worry about it. Or don't worry about it. Or maybe it would be official. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that is a good point. <laughs> That is a great point. That could be the government officials. <laughs> There's some other uh, ones that we've talked about a little bit in the top 10. Um, we didn't get on, on the environment in any of our answers, but five of the top 10 answers to fears in 2018 dealt with the environment. People are afraid of pollution, of water and air, extinction, climate change. Couple more answers in the top 10 deal with finance. Not having enough money for the future, being stuck with high medical bills. And dying, somebody mentioned this one. People I love dying or people I love becoming seriously ill. And this is all a lot of great fun and super depressing to look through this list and think about all the things that scare people generally, but it's really sterile and impersonal. And uh, one of my favorite things in my talks is to get personal. So I'm going to share with you a bunch of fears that I have. And it's going to start with some really primal ones. I am terrified of dogs. Absolutely terrified, especially of strange dogs. <clears throat> I do not like them. Uh, sorry, is there something you're seeing? Something different you're seeing over there? <laughs> it is creepy, isn't it? Two different color eyes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so only about 4% of Americans claim to be afraid of dogs. I'm afraid of dogs because when I was in my 20s, I got bit um, by a strange dog. I was at a friend's house, and the neighbor's Dalmatian came over and nudged their way in the door, and it looked really cute. And I said, hey, puppy, and I stuck my hand out, and within seconds, the dog was attached to my hand. And since that moment, I do not trust dogs at all. Snakes. I do not like snakes. About a quarter of Americans do not like snakes. Anyone in here afraid of snakes? I really don't. I can, I, so I can explain it as this. You can tell me what a physio physiological miracle it is, the way that they move. I just think it's creepy and that they're just going to attack me at some point. <laughs> I have some more long-term fears, too. <laughs> this is one that I feel in my stomach right now, actually. Um, I have a fear of getting old. This is a, a, a shot from the movie About Schmidt. Does, does anyone remember this movie from the early 2000s? Yeah, so this stars Jack Nicholson, and he's a retiree who finds himself more and more alone as he gets older because all of his friends are dying. When I watched this movie, my stomach hurt so bad I was curled into a ball on the couch and it wasn't until that moment that I realized how absolutely terrified I am of getting old and dying. Uh, that's my wife, Stephanie. Say hello to Steph. Hello. Thank you for not being rude. Uh, I'm afraid that my wife is going to get sick of my emotional immaturity and she's going to leave me. I'm not, I'm not even joking. That's a serious fear that I have. And it's a fear about relationships. I think a lot of us are afraid of relationships. Some of us fear being in them. 
Some of us fear not being in them, messing them up or raising your kids poorly. And then work. Who's got fears about work? Things that give them anxiety, that make them uncomfortable. Right, who doesn't? Um, I get a surprising amount of anxiety from sending a calendar invite to more than two people. It, it honestly will take me three days to do it. Where I'll just look through their calendars and be like, okay, this looks open, but they've got lunch right after. I don't want to interrupt their lunch. I don't want to like give them, like who, who, who on this invite needs gaps between their meetings and who likes them stacked against each other? And I'll go back and forth on that. <coughs> you might be afraid of taking a job that you'll regret or asking for a raise because that's a really uncomfortable conversation. I'm afraid of telling my boss how I really feel a lot of the time. Um, so it's really important to me when I start a job that I make sure that I get that connection open. And when that connection closes, I get real uncomfortable. I'm also afraid of taking ownership of a feature or a system or a project or a team. When I was young, I was always really excited at the opportunity to be known as the person who knows everything about this one thing. And now I'm just scared of the commitment of having to be that one person who knows everything about that one thing. I fear self-promotion and I'm afraid that uh, I'll come off as being too braggy or that you'll find out that I'm not worth self-promoting. And I hear what you're thinking right now. You're thinking, Steve, you spent like two minutes at the beginning of this talk bragging about all the things that you do. And you're right, except it was excruciating and I had to force myself to do it. Yeah. At least you're not afraid of peacocks. I'm not afraid of peacocks. And I, <laughs> I, hope, I should have put that on the content <laughs> one. Uh, also peacocks. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid that I'm going to look dumb. I'm afraid that people will think that I don't know something. My therapist and I actually did some work on this recently, and we traced it back to when I was very, very young. I was in kindergarten for about a quarter of the year, and then I got moved up to first grade. And ever since that moment, I've been basically trying to prove to everyone that I'm smart enough to hang with those older kids. Public speaking. You may have heard that people fear public speaking more than they fear death. Uh, great news, America. That's not the case anymore. 2% more people fear death than do public speaking. <laughs> this is real progress. I'm super proud of us all. Uh, and it's only 28% people who fear death and 26% who fear public speaking. Surprisingly low numbers. I'm generally not afraid of public speaking, but in moments like this, sometimes I am. Right before, I am. In talks where I'm getting a little bit more personal, I get a little, a little more anxious and nervous up here. But a lot of these fears that I just covered, and, and many like them, are kind of the same underlying fear. They're a fear of rejection. And these fears of rejection are what I'm really interested in today. Because these are the fears that prevent us from doing really great things with our career. From deciding to start that blog that you've been meaning to start. Or writing that book that you want to write. Or to get up here and start speaking to others. Or taking on a new role or responsibilities that look like they're pretty cool, but you're just afraid to do it. Or even bigger, quitting your job and going solo, starting your own company. There's a lot of fear of rejection involved in all of those things. And on a personal level, overcoming these kinds of fears is the, it's the best move that I've made in my career. It got me speaking locally and then regionally and then internationally and now here giving a closing keynote. Well, I don't know how that happens even. Um, it got me my current job. I met my current coworker, John, at a conference that I was speaking at. He came to one of my talks. You were there too. Joel, Joel was there with me. Um, John came to talk to me and within two weeks I was interviewing at Artsy, which was amazing. And so I'm hopeful that I can help you overcome the things that are holding you back and that it can change your life the way that it has changed mine. And before we really dig in here, I don't think this is the first time you've seen a slide like this today. At least it's not the first time I've seen a slide like this today. A really quick disclaimer, I am not a doctor, I am not a psychologist, I don't have any training in this stuff. I mostly am making stuff up that I read on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And the fear that I'm talking about today is not that kind of anxiety and that kind of fear that leaves you crippled and unable to face the day where you feel like you can't walk out the door. I don't have any ability to discuss or diagnose or treat that type of anxiety and fear. I do have the ability to support you and assist you in finding help if you feel that describes you. So if you do, um, this URL will help you find a therapist. It takes you, uh, I forget which website it is, I think it's psychology today. Um, it'll take you to a therapist finder or come find me and I'll help you go through that process. For today, the fears that I'm really talking about are a little bit lighter weight. They're the fears that hinder us from being the best versions of us in our jobs. Okay, why do we fear things? The popular science looks like this. There's a group of structures in our brain. They sit generally above the brainstem and they're called the limbic system. And this system is involved in many of the emotions and motivations that we feel in our body that are related to survival and reproduction. Things like fear and anger and memory generally flow through this area of the brain. And it has many jobs, but one of them is to take inputs from your senses, from your eyes, from your ears, etc., and send them to a part of your brain that's a little bit newer than the limbic system, a, an area in the front of your brain called the prefrontal cortex. This is more involved. There are many creatures who have limbic systems who don't have a prefrontal cortex, but many species like us do. The cortex does a really good job of identifying the threats that are sent to it and non-threats. And then based on what it determines, it can trigger an appropriate response in your body. But it's slow. And sometimes we don't have a lot of time to process threats. We've got to act quickly. And so the limbic system has security clearance to make snap judgments and totally skip the prefrontal cortex and send your body into a response. It'd be nice if it could involve the prefrontal cortex, but it's, while it's smart, it is slow. And so this is often where we feel that fight or flight uh, symptom in our body. It's sort of like how every time that I put a pizza in my oven at home, within 30 seconds, the smoke alarm in the hallway goes off. I know that it's not on fire, but that dumb old smoke detector or the limbic system in this analogy does not know that. It just senses smoke and it sends off a panic. And this system is really great. It has helped us survive as a species. It's like legacy code. It's just, it's been out there for a really, really long time and it works and just nobody touch it. And we're born with this system, and we're born with the ability to fear things, but current studies, according to my research, indicate that we aren't actually born with any fears. At birth, we are fearless. We might be born with the fear of loud sounds, but that's debatable. And we also develop a fear of falling pretty early on, but that doesn't appear to happen until after we're born. The majority, if not all, of our fears are learned. We're definitely predisposed to some of them, the more primal ones especially, snakes and spiders. But most of them we learn by association. And the reason that happens is because that limbic system, the way that it's able to determine if something is a threat before, uh, without allowing the cortex to figure out if it's a threat, is with some simple pattern matching. If it sees something that resembles something that has been a threat to us in the past or has hurt us in the past, it gets categorized as something worth fearing and it ships it to the body to deal with it. And so it might be that we have an experience with a dog that bites you and now we associate dogs with something we should fear. But it might not even really be all about you. It might be more distant. It might be that you're around someone who has experienced something in the past. This explains why my daughter, shown here, her name is Lila. She's standing in front of some sheep. Um, she's never had a bad experience with a dog in her life, but she is absolutely terrified of them also. 
A couple years ago, a friendly dog ran up to her to say hi to her, and she literally climbed me like a tree and yelled at the dog to go away. My theory on what happened is that when she was younger, a toddler, we would go for walks around the neighborhood, and the house right around the corner had a big white, I'm sure dog lovers know what kind of dog this is, but it was like a huskyish, fluffy thing. Um, and it was absolutely beautiful, a beautiful dog, but I, I was terrified of that dog. And so every time we would walk past that corner, you better believe I grabbed her hand tight and I pulled her away from the dog and put her on the other side and we walked quickly to get past that dog. And now she associates dogs with her dad being scared. And that's one of the most terrifying things I can think of. This pattern matching is also why once you develop a fear of something, it grows worse over time. The pattern matching continues to associate things with a threat and it gets a little bit of wiggle room on either side. And now things that aren't really related to that original threat are also scary. And your, threat, your, your fear just gets bigger and bigger and bigger every time you fear it a little bit. In addition, there is no guarantee that you will learn a fear by association. For example, uh, I mentioned that I am terrified of snakes. This is my other daughter, Olivia, um, and she's seen pretty happy here uh, on a backpacking trip. Um, except you zoom and enhance that photo a little bit, and what you find is she's smiling because she's standing next to a literal pile of snakes. <laughs> yes, I know they're garter snakes, and they're not dangerous. I don't care. They still move incorrectly. <laughs> uh, and as I took that photo, she said to me, Dad, I'm so happy they're slithering by my feet. <laughs> I'm like, let's go. But I didn't do it. I wanted to. I knew how happy she was in that moment, and I didn't want to give her a fear that she shouldn't have. So that's kind of the science behind fear. That's what happens in our body. Um, but I want to explore how we develop fears of rejection a little more, too. Some of the things that trigger it. We are concerned how others perceive us. We don't want them to see us as unlike them. There's a really great article on the, the website Wait But Why. Um, if you've not been to that site before, you should definitely go check it out. There's a lot of interesting stuff. Um, but the, the main author there, Tim Urban, has an article called The Social Survival Mammoth. And he talks about this mammoth that lives inside of us all, that bullies us into fearing even an ounce of rejection. And the science behind it, he argues, is that thousands of years ago, when we lived in caves, being rejected meant having to sleep outside of the cave with the saber-toothed tigers, which likely meant death. And our civilizations have evolved where this isn't really a threat anymore. But our biology hasn't. It can't evolve that fast. And so we're stuck with this mammoth living inside of us, it's been hanging around for far too long. It doesn't really make sense anymore. In the end, Tim's post helps us realize one important fact. Almost nothing that you're socially scared of is actually scary. Another reason you develop these fears of rejection is that we see others succeed, and then we compare ourselves to them. It's not helpful, and it's a major cause of things like imposter syndrome. But even more, it's untrue. Because when we look at them, we see their path to success being basically a straight line. Over time, they just got more successful. They achieved the things that they wanted to achieve. And that's not how our path looked. But in reality, their path looks just like ours. It's up and down, and it winds all over the place, and there's twists and turns, and some things really worked out, and some things did not work out at all. And every one of those twists and turns is where we see ourselves failing. And that effect is magnified with social media, which causes damaging social, uh, psychological effects, probably also social effects, because of this nature to compare ourselves to others. 
we're really good at humans at seeing negative possibilities. And as people in the tech industry, we're extremely good at finding the negative possibilities. It actually makes us better at our job. But if we look at the possible range of outcomes in any situation, there's a whole bunch of good ones at the top, and there's a whole bunch in the middle, and then there's those ones at the bottom. And when we look at them, we don't focus on the ones in the middle. We might look at a couple at the top that are exciting and amazing, but we're mostly going to look at the ones at the bottom. Those are the ones that we're most worried about. And so those are the ones that we focus on and that we think about. And if we're offered a choice between two options, one in which the range of outcomes is nice and tightly clustered around the middle there, and there's no amazing outcomes, but there's also no awful outcomes, and one in which the outcomes are more spread out, and there are some bad things that could happen, but there are also so, some really amazing things, we will, every time, take that one on the left, the one that has the high floor and the low ceiling. Because it has the least scary negative outcomes. Even though the other one ha clearly has better options for us, we're just avoiding risk. And that risk avoidance works really, really well when the risks are real. But when it comes to these fears of rejection, our brain tells us stories, and very often those stories are unfounded lies. We really do suffer more in our imagination than we do in reality. So, with some better understanding of the nature of fear, I want to offer you some strategies for overcoming the fears that are holding you back. And we'll start by preparing to attack our fear. A handful of strategies that relate to preparation. We are going to start by finding a squad of people. Finding a squad that you can fail in front of, or better yet, fail with. They might be people with the same goals as you, they might have different goals than you. They might be people just like you. They might be different than you. But there's several important things that you're looking for from that squad. For starters, psychological safety. If any of you don't feel comfortable failing in front of each other, that's going to create difficult power dynamics for you to work through as a group. You're going to hold each other accountable for the things that you're trying to do. Ruinous empathy is when we have really difficult feedback to give the people we care about, but we don't want to hurt their feelings, so we don't give it to them. And we're going to avoid that, because that's not going to help them grow. Give them difficult feedback because you care about their growth. And you're going to get reassurance from each other that the fears are not what rule you. And you can work through those fears and those failures together. And now you and your squad are going to focus on your successes instead of your failures. We focus a lot on the things that we don't want. You're going to focus on the things that you do and how you're going to accomplish them. When we're worried about what we don't want and we're worried about those failures, we end up self-sabotaging. And I'm going to show a couple of examples from the outdoors to illustrate this. We'll start on a mountain bike trail. I actually learned how to mountain bike here in Stevens Point. Um, I started riding on the Green Circle, and then I graduated to riding on the uh, Plover River Trail and riding out to the sandbar and jumping in the water there. I don't know if anyone knows what I'm talking about, but it was great. Uh, but when you start mountain biking, the trail looks like this. All you see on that trail are the obstacles, and you just want to avoid them. But that's all you look at are those trees to go through and those rocks to go around and those roots to ride over. As you become a more skilled mountain biker, the trail starts to look like this. It doesn't look like the obstacles anymore. It looks like the line that gets you through the obstacles most quickly. And as you ride through, you don't even see the obstacles anymore. They're a blur as you just ride the line that you're focused on. A similar example is seen in rock climbing. If you go to a climbing gym, you will see people at the bottom of the wall doing this. They're looking up and they've got their hands in strange positions and then they move their hands and they shift their body and it looks really, really funny. Um, but what they're doing is they're planning the route. They're looking at that route on the wall and they're figuring out the exact places they're going to put their hands and when they're going to put them there and how they're going to shift their body so that they can get up that route. Because if they start thinking about what they don't want to do instead of what they have to do, they're just not going to complete that route. 
So those are some real life examples of times when you have to focus on the successes in order to, to do it. Um, I really think it'd be useful if we did the same thing with our careers. And one tool that can help you focus on successes instead of failures is what I call my wall of motivation. My wall of motivation is a Trello board that I maintain where I capture all of the things that I'm proud of, the feedback that I've gotten from people that makes me feel good about what I'm doing, the emails I've received that, that tell me that I've changed someone's life or I've made things so much easier for them, anything that I'm really, really proud of, my sub two hour half marathon on trail. As a word of caution, when you do focus on failures instead of successes, you end up self-handicapping. And this is when you self-select yourself out of opportunities. You avoid effort because you're afraid of the failure hurting you. An example is when you look at a, a job posting and you think, this looks amazing. I wanna work for this company. I have all the skills to do this. I would love to have this job. And you say, but they would never hire me. And you don't submit. You never even give them the chance to say yes. And that kind of behavior holds you back. And it's important to catch it and nip it. A second group of strategies relates to practice. Let's implement some practices to help ourselves get better at overcoming fear. We'll start with a practice called fear setting. And this comes from uh, Tim Ferriss in a TED talk that he gave. He described why you should define your fears instead of your goals. And he describes this fear setting idea as we want to visualize the worst case scenarios in detail that you fear, the ones that are preventing you from taking action so that you can take action to overcome that paralysis. And he suggests making three lists. In the first list, define your fears. Write down all those things that you are afraid of, those things that are holding you back from doing something. In your second list, we're going to write down some actual steps that we can take to prevent those things from happening. And you can see how this is getting a little bit proactive. And then our third list, if any of those things were to happen, how would we recover from them? What are some things that we could do? This isn't all there is to fear setting. Uh, and you can see the rest in his TED talk, which I have links to at the end of my slides which are again at that URL. <clears throat> but this should get you started thinking about how you can do some proactive thinking to overcome those nightmare scenarios that your fears dream up. Another practice uh, is an experiment that was run by a man named Jia Zhang, um, which is called, he called it rejection therapy. And with rejection, rejection therapy, his goal was to desensitize himself from the pain of rejection and overcome his fear. And what he did was for a hundred days straight, he forced himself to do something that would result in him getting rejected. So asking someone out or going to the Cheesecake Factory and asking them to sing happy birthday to him when it wasn't his birthday. <gasps> or trying to meet former President Obama. And there's a couple quotes from his experiment that I think are really remarkable. He says, our imagination often takes us to the worst possible outcome, causing us to be much less likely to take that action. We really are, we really are our own worst rejectors. And my rejection therapy taught me that the worst they can say is no is actually not true. In fact, the worst they can say is you didn't even ask. It implies I said no to myself before others could reject me. This rejection therapy, it's practice in the utmost sense. It's literally practicing getting rejected. And it takes advantage of something called habituation, which really just means the more you are exposed to something, the less it affects you. The less uncomfortable that rejection feels. You might also build yourself a rejection ritual if you know that you're going to be getting a lot of rejection. Maybe you're applying for jobs and you're expecting not everyone is gonna to wanna to hire you. That's how it works. 
Define a routine for yourself for every time you do receive a rejection. A routine for job hunting might be, okay, when I get that rejection, the first thing I'm gonna do is send a thank you. Thanks for considering me. Then I'm gonna go back to my wall of motivation. I'm gonna review the praise and accomplishments that make me feel like I'm doing the right thing, I'm on the right path. And then I'm gonna go submit two more applications to work somewhere. And it's important to write this down or commit to it and just make sure that you're doing it every time because if you do, it becomes a habit and that's really, really important. These rituals, they'll reroute your automatic responses because our body has automatic responses. Some of us are better than others at slowing down to avoid automatic responses. But a ritual like this can really help you reroute it from something negative to something positive. It slows you down so that you can start thinking about the fear logically instead of emotionally. It's possible, from what I understand, that it might be that this allows your prefrontal cortex to start to process it a little more logically instead. It shifts your self-talk from something negative to something positive. Instead of dwelling on another failure, now you're feeling good about doing the right thing. And if it becomes a habit, it makes decisions for you. You don't have to think about doing a habit. Think about brushing your teeth in the morning. Do you get up and tell yourself, I need to go brush my teeth? No, you don't. You just get up and you go brush your teeth. It's part of your habit, unless you are a remote worker, in which case you have about three days before your family will tell you that you need to go brush your teeth. <laughs> On average, maximum of four. <laughs> uh, a lot of the things that I'm talking about in this, in this uh, practice section, and some of the ones we'll touch on a little bit later, are related to cognitive behavioral therapy. They're, they're more formalized there. Um, cognitive behavior, behavioral therapy is a technique that's used to reframe negative thought patterns into positive ones. Like I said, those automatic responses that we have, we want to guide them to be positive ones instead of negative ones. With cognitive behavioral therapy, you'll practice being mindful of your emotions and your thoughts, and you're going to work to transform those thought patterns into productive behaviors. A third set of strategies focuses on physical presence and being present in the moment. What we're really looking to do is maintain a strong and mindful presence. This is going to put us on a better trajectory to handle any of those challenges. Might start with something like a power pose. If anyone's been to that conference, that's what you do at the beginning of that conference every time. Uh, but this is, uh, there's some research done by Amy Cuddy that says that if you stand in a position of power, it will improve your confidence. So she says, stand like a superhero. Uh, if you feel better doing that, great. I feel goofy. <laughs> Having said that, I do, I do have my own power pose. Uh, I prefer mountain pose, which is a posture that comes from yoga. And this is one where I just stand super tall and breathe deep and close my eyes. And it helps me center myself and helps me slow down my emotions and feel like I'm in control of my body and of everything that's going on. Physical exercise in general is really important. It has tremendous long-term benefits. It will help you live longer. It also may have some short-term benefits for you. It can improve your mood. It can reduce anxiety and depression. I used to be a late night exerciser. Maybe like nine o'clock at night, I'd go to the gym after the kids were in bed. Uh, but then I realized I'm totally wasting all those good feelings I feel by going to bed an hour later. And so now I'm getting better at uh, getting up early before everyone's awake and getting that exercise in. And then I get to carry all those great feelings the entire day. And again, it puts me on that positive trajectory. We can get better at recognizing and naming our emotions. Fear is a pretty general emotion and it can be really helpful for us to be more specific about what's going on. Maybe these are some more specific fearful emotions that you're feeling, insecure or anxious or trapped. 
The act of trying to name your emotion is another thing that'll slow the processing down a little bit, maybe give your cortex a chance to, to deal with it. It definitely gives your body the sense that uh, things are slowing down so that you can be in control of the situation and process things properly. Meditation also can have some really great benefits. It can level your emotional responses. I find that, that, does, that, that, that it does that for me. Um, you become better at treating emotions as logical facts instead of inescapable feelings. And it can increase your persistence to focus on a problem for longer. Again, I recently started meditating, or I, I recently have been able to build a meditation habit because I realized if I do it in the morning, I get to carry all those great feelings throughout the day. And I had noticed that I just felt better at the end of the day when I meditated and when I got a workout in the morning. Negative self-talk increases the difficulty of any activity that you do. Negative self-talk is that nagging voice that tells you that you can't do something or that you should just give up. Just choose different words. Choose different words that you would use to talk to your friends when they did something and they failed. A mantra is a very specific type of self-talk. It's a word or short phrase that you can use as an anchor point and return to throughout the day. And so when you feel like you've lost your focus, repeat that phrase and suddenly you're back with that focus. I use them a lot. Here's a handful of ones that I've used recently. Uh, the top one I used um, for my half marathon that I did. The middle one is one that I use all the time and it's my absolute favorite. Choosing my own suffering is the ultimate privilege. It reminds me that I am so lucky that the thing that I got to worry about today was to come up here and talk to people and not fight for water or fight for food or fight for my life. And then there are some tricks that you can play with your mind using time travel. Visualize yourself in the future. Travel a few days forward. I did this last night. I said, one day from now, I'm going to be at Goose with a beer in my hand, having just given the closing keynote, and I'm going to feel really good about it. Or visualize yourself further in the future, years down the road, when you've met that incredible goal that you've set for yourself. Looking back on this moment right now where you were beginning the process, And finally, I want to leave you with a few stories of perspective. Some stories that might help us overcome our fears. Let's start by embracing failure. We live in an amazing time. And Tim talked about it this morning. He talked about growth mindsets. Thanks to the world of tech startups, especially, failure right now is something that we embrace. It's almost encouraged. As long as you're using it for something good, you're using it for growth or learning. This was definitely not the case when I was a kid. I remember being in school and basically if I didn't get A's, the kids who didn't get A's, you know, they felt awful. Like they were failures. Today they teach this stuff in school. This growth mindset. When I walk around my kids' school, I see posters all over the place. Talking about how it's okay to fail as long as you're using it to grow. And this is awesome. This is a quote from a former coworker of mine. Um, he and I were snowboarding, and I was describing to him how I kept falling when I would go down the hill. And he said, well, if you ain't falling, you ain't learning. And it was one of those things where he just had this way of saying things that were way more profound than they seemed in the moment. And now I look back on this stupid day that we were snowboarding, but this one thing that he said to me is something that I now embrace and I I say it all the time about everything that I do in my life. And when we do fall, it's important to forgive ourselves, to treat ourselves as we would treat a friend. If they tried something amazing and they didn't succeed, you wouldn't beat them up and tell them, well, you never were going to get that job anyways. But that's what you say to yourself. We spend so much time comparing ourselves to those around us. And when we see someone who's successful, 
this is what we see. We see their biggest success, their greatest success, their biggest accomplishment. This huge thing that they've grown, and I wish that I could grow a tree like that. And I can't even get a tree bigger than this. But what you don't see when you look at those other people is all the saplings that have sprouted up around that tree. All those attempts that they took in order to get that massive accomplishment. They've been laying seeds for a very, very long time. And you can do that too. That's all it takes. And some luck. But cultivating a garden doesn't result in an immediate harvest. It comes later in life. It comes with persistence and consistency and luck and doing the work. All right. Recapping the different strategy groups we had, we're going to prepare ourselves for the challenge of doing something scary. We're going to practice overcoming our fears of rejection so that it becomes easier. We're going to maintain a strong and mindful presence. And we're going to maintain perspective that failure is, it's okay, as long as you're using it for learning and growth. And I have one more story to tell, and I'm actually going to tell you a story about the story before I tell you the story, because it's a totally stupid story. Um, and you just have to bear with me. Uh, but so there's this movie um, from 1981 called The Long Shot Kids. Has anyone seen it? It's a movie about foosball and it stars uh, Leif Garrett. No one has seen it. It's, it's really hokey and you should totally go look it up. But there's this scene where one of the two of the, the main characters are talking and one of them asks the other, How, why do you play soccer? Because that's his route to foosball is through soccer. Oh, uh, yeah, I was playing baseball and I, hate, I, I just was so bored. And then I saw this one kid and the ball rolled to him at second base and he didn't have time to pick it up. So he kicked it with his foot and we got the double play and we won the game. And that's the story. And it's ridiculous. It's supposed to be this inspiring thing. And so I have this story that I'm going to tell, which is when I, when I tell it, it's just like that. But just bear with me because there's more at the end. Um, so my story is about climbing again, because that's all I like to talk about. Um, but there's a, there's a discipline of climbing called bouldering. And in bouldering, you don't have ropes, uh, which sounds really scary, but the wall's really short and the floor is padded. So you don't hurt yourself. Uh, but I was working on a bouldering route, and I remember the moment that I fell in love with bouldering because I was in the gym by myself, and I was working on this route where I had to make this big move to move my left hand really far and hang on to something really tight and keep my body from swinging off, and it was really hard to do, and my arms were exhausted, and I had tried it like eight times, and I had failed. Um, and I was hanging there on the wall about to do my last one. I'm like, all right, I'm going to give it one more shot. I thought I was alone, except that someone walked in the gym as I got to that that move and he said come on man you got this and I was like in my head no I don't <laughs> like I'm so burned out I should just drop off the wall right now um, and he's like no come on you got it I'm like all right this stranger has fearless confidence that I can do this so I'm just gonna try it um, and I tried it and I did it and I, we got the double play and we won the game <laughs> totally stupid <laughs> but here's here's the point about this story um, the point about the story is that we spend a lot of time making up stories to tell ourselves. We tell ourselves lies. We tell ourselves that we can't do something. We convince ourselves that we just aren't capable or that it shouldn't be us. It should be someone else because we're afraid of failing. We're afraid of the rejection that goes along with it. But sometimes you just need a stranger to walk into the gym with fearless confidence and remind you that, yeah, you can do it. And so just as that guy walked in on me when I thought he wasn't there and he inspired me to give it a shot, whatever it is that you are scared of, whatever it is that you're afraid to start, that you haven't been able to start, I'm here as a stranger to remind you that, yeah, you can do it. You're capable of amazing things. Uh, you got this. Um, thanks for your time.